you can notice already, <clears throat> one thing might happen that I can't talk anymore. That's really unfortunate. And the other thing, my laptop might run out of battery life and I only have a European uh, charger, but uh, I hope we will be fine with both. <clears throat> yeah, um, Matthias talked a lot about uh, not only but using uh, Elasticsearch for, for log analysis, like uh, doing centralized logging with Elasticsearch, and that's a really, really good use case. And if you're not doing centralized logging already, for big applications, it's really, really helpful. And for developers, that's a really, really great thing to have. The last project I did, we had um, centralized logging with Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch for business reporting, and Elasticsearch as a search engine, all in the same project. So that was really nice to have. Yeah, I'm uh, Florian, I'm from Germany originally, and I'm doing a lot with search, obviously with Elasticsearch. Matthias just reminded me that this is the old logo and I shouldn't use it anymore, but I like it better than the newer stuff <laughs> because of the, of the glasses, yeah. <clears throat> but I'm also doing a lot with uh, Lucene and Solar as well, so I'm, I'm more on the side of doing application development. Um, but also a, a bit of centralized logging and stuff like this. And besides the search stuff, which I mainly do as an independent developer and consultant, I'm a classic back-end developer, I would say, all in the, the Java landscape, like doing classical stuff like uh, Spring and Hibernate, and also different databases like MongoDB, MySQL, and all the different microservice, uh, microservice uh, technologies that are available and hot right now. Um, yeah, I'm extremely happy to be here today. Um, <clears throat> as you might notice, I, I'm doing a user group, the Java user group in my hometown as well, or I used to be the organizer. Um, that's, um, we are maybe the same size of people, I guess, normally, doing talks every month, so it's really fine uh, to be here as a speaker at the Java user group here. And I'm also one of the organizers for the search meetup, which is more specialized. I think there are two meetups like this in Singapore as well, but uh, there haven't been any uh, talks for a while. Yeah, Singapore, I really, really like Singapore. I'm, I'm here um, for the fourth time, I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's, that's one of the pictures that was available for free. So, <laughs> so I, I took care that I don't have any problems with licensing. So are there um, more buildings right now? Exactly. Okay, I, I didn't notice, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so maybe that's because, uh, because I'm mainly here for the food normally, so I really, really like the, the food in Singapore. And um, all of this sums up, it's a really nice city, I like the food, so currently I'm looking for work in Singapore, so I'm looking into relocating here. Um, yeah, but that's... <laughs> Yeah, may, may, maybe if you have interesting jobs, I would be happy to talk to you. <clears throat> yeah, that's enough about me. This is about Elasticsearch, of course, and um, the Java clients for Elasticsearch. But for now, um, Matthias showed already some parts of how Elasticsearch works, but let's take one step back and look uh, at the basics again. This is a definition from the Elastic website. Uh, Elasticsearch is a distributed JSON-based search and analytics engine. We heard a lot about this already. Designed for horizontal scalability, maximum reliability, and easy management. I really, really like this definition because it's, it's a very, very uh, concise uh, definition containing a lot of the different aspects of what Elasticsearch is. Important for us right now, <clears throat> Let's first look at the aspect that it's a JSON-based search and analytic engine. What does it mean? First, let's have a look at what search is generally. Like, this is something maybe everybody of you has seen already and used already maybe. This is the, the GitHub website <clears throat> where you can just uh, search for different projects or code snippets or something like this you're doing a keyword search. So search normally is keyword search, easy. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the aspects that 
that distinguishes Elasticsearch or search engines generally from databases is the notion of relevance we have already heard about already. Um, and you can see that when searching for Elasticsearch, it is very, very likely that somebody searching for this term is meaning the project Elasticsearch. And this is also what, what is happening here. GitHub already manages to have this project on the first uh, position, even though there are other projects with the same name. So I don't know what GitHub is doing internally, but I could guess that they are also um, using the, the popularity of projects for boosting this. So this is important for search, that the user gets the documents they are looking for at the first places. Besides, th besides that, uh, from this screen, you can also see a lot of dis different aspects for su supporting features of search. Like um, there's this, uh, this highlighting features, which lets you see uh, where a match occurred. So this can help the user um, to, to see if the document really is the one he's looking for, or she. And also you can sort by other aspects. Um, there's a lot more supporting features. For example, this year, the faceting, we already have heard um, it's um, for, for refining the current search. And this is done using the aggregations feature of Elasticsearch. Um, all of this, a search like this, can be built using Elasticsearch. And in this case, with GitHub, it's Elasticsearch as well. They're using it for, for a really, really large amount of data. And uh, working fine, I think. OK, if you want to build something like this ourselves, of course, we first have to install Elasticsearch. That's really, really easy. All we have to do is download the artifact. Like it's, a, it's an archive, like a zip archive, but there's also tar GZ as well. <clears throat> Unpack it and run a script. All you need to have available is a Java runtime. Um, and that's all you have to do for now. Once it's running, you can just uh, call it using HTTP. I am using curl here, the command line HTTP client, just doing a request on the, on the uh, default port of Elasticsearch 9200. And Elasticsearch will answer with this JSON document here. It's, um, just a bit of information, um, like the underlying Lucene version that is used for the search features, or the, the build uh, date of the libraries. Um, but for us, it's important the application is running. That's what you can see here. And Elasticsearch is used in JSON everywhere, so we will see that a lot. OK, but we really want to, to build um, to build an application. And for me, what is um, very important is with all the good food in Singapore, um, I, of course, want to be able to find it. So I will be indexing different dishes in uh, Singapore. Like um, this is uh, the chicken rice, very popular. I like it. And this is a, a classic document that can be indexed in Elasticsearch automatically. <clears throat> Um, you can see different aspects of JSON documents um, available here. Like there's uh, simple strings, but there's also this kind of lists or array where you ha can have multiple strings. And also you can have sub-documents, like the, here with the favorite section, and uh, some, um, some numeric types, Boolean types, and the geotypes we already have heard. So where are we putting this, this data? Um, this is, um, we just added two fragments to, to the URL here. The first one is the index name, uh, which is uh, just a logical collection of, uh, of documents. It's like a database in the relational world. You can just choose anything. The thing behind it is the type of the document, and the type determines the structure, how it will be, a search, uh, how it will be stored in Elasticsearch, and how it can be searched afterwards. It's very important to know that even though we have uh, indexed another document before, um, <clears throat> there's no need that all of the documents need to be the same. 
So even though it's very, very advisable, and normally in applications you will have documents that are, uh, are very close in structure, but of course you can leave parts of the original document out or add other attributes. So it's, it's uh, uh, a schema-free style of development. Like there is a schema in the background, but for the user it's, uh, you can really evolve the, the documents easily. <clears throat> Once we have indexed those documents without doing any configuration, we can already search them this time using a GET request um, on this underscore search endpoint. And in, in the easiest case, we can just add one parameter um, with, containing the search term. And this works without any configuration. Uh, it returns the two documents we have indexed. And in a list here, it will also contain uh, the original source of the documents we have indexed. So without doing any configuration work, um, you can easily start Elasticsearch, index documents, and search them. Using parameters alone uh, wouldn't work. We want to have a lot of search features, and uh, the queries can get rather complicated. That's why with Elasticsearch, normally you don't do the parameter stuff, but you're using the so-called query DSL instead. This is now a post request that sends a JSON body to Elasticsearch for search. And this JSON structure here uh, describes the query that we are about to do. <clears throat> In this case, we are having one match query here. Match query is the kind of, um, it, uh, it's used mode most often for the full text search stuff. Um, we, are, we are querying on a, a special field that is a combination of all other fields and say we want to have uh, rice contained anywhere. And then we're adding another filter here um, <clears throat> that queries the, the tags. And this is the, the keyword feature that was in introduced in Elasticsearch 5. So this means this needs to be an exact match down here, but this is a free text match. So there might be more processing over here. So this is the way Elasticsearch is working. It, at first, it might seem a bit of overhead, like passing this huge uh, JSON structure just for search. But um, it's really, really useful. Um, and um, it's easier to get started with it. And even uh, it's easier to maintain it after a while. So the query DSL is also the place where you would request a lot of the other features like highlighting, aggregations, and stuff like this, you can do a lot more with it. And also, um, normally you don't use, for production applications, you don't use this feature that you can just index documents. You would normally uh, define a mapping for them, but those are features that are um, out of scope for now because we just want to look at how we can use Elasticsearch with Java. But first, let's look at another aspect that is also contained here in this, um, in this definition. Um, it says that Elasticsearch is distributed and uh, designed for horizontal scalability, maximum reliability. This, of course, um, means that um, starting one node only is not enough normally. Like, what we can do is um, we will have one Elasticsearch node and our application somewhere. Application can be Java application or even something else. This will uh, access Elasticsearch and use it for search or anything else. Um, once this node go goes down, our application would be down as well. And uh, this is not what we want to do and want to have with a high reliable application. So what you normally are going to do is to have multiple of the Elasticsearch nodes those will form a cluster automatically. Um, it used to be more magic in the background. Right now you have to configure a lot more to have the production mode uh, Matthias talked about. But still, it's, it's rather easy to, to, to manage the cluster. Um, still, you can talk to one node only, and it will take care that it will ask the correct node where the data resides. Um, for the information. So this feature is for high availability. We don't want the node, uh, the cluster to go down totally. 
And uh, secondly, it's for um, maintaining a very uh, large data sets, larger that, are, uh, that fit on one node. So those are the two aspects here. OK, let's recap. That's the basics of Elasticsearch. Um, it's a Java-based search server, uses HTTP and JSON everywhere. Um, the search and filtering query DSL is, is uh, very powerful. Like There are so many queries um, for different use cases. Often you have to combine them with the analyzing process. And uh, there are lots of features for supporting search, uh, mostly uh, from Lucene, like the highlighting and suggestions, but also um, custom features like uh, faceting using the aggregation. And very important, it's a distributed system. Uh, the nodes can form a cluster. OK, let's look at the first option uh, there is to, uh, to access uh, Elasticsearch from Java. This is also the one that is the oldest. It's the so-called transport client. The, this was available for Elasticsearch for, for uh, always, I, I think. Um, <clears throat> it, with Elasticsearch 5.0, 5 um, this is now a separate um, artifact. You can use it uh, from Maven or here from Gradle. Just say you want the uh, transport client available, so it will pull down some jars, a lot of jars. <clears throat> um, then you can do, like, you define a transport address. That is one address for accessing your cluster. In my case, it's running on the local machine, so localhost um, port 9300. And then you can build a client, one of the clients from this, the pre-built transport client it's called right now, pass any set settings that might be necessary, like when you have a custom cluster name or something like this, and add the address. This client interface can then be used to do everything with Elasticsearch. Like you can do the classical search applications, you can do the indexing stuff, you can um, do the administration and monitoring and everything. Let's look at the search part. Again, this is the same query we have seen before. The good thing with the transport client API is that it's very close um, to what the query DSL does. So what you can often do is like you, you experiment with the query DSL, just uh, typing in in the browser or the excellent sense plugin, which is now also part of Kibana. Um, and once you are, um, you, are, um, um, you are happy about your result, you can just take this structure and uh, nearly one-on-one -on -one do this with the Java application. This uh, above here is the code that searches uh, the same query. And if we recall what we had uh, before here, there's a bool query that contains a must section and a filter section the must section contains the match and the term in the filter. And we can see the same thing here. There's a bool query, contains a must section with the match query, and a filter with the term query. So it's, it's really easy going from uh, the query DSL to the Java part again. There's a bit more before here. We are uh, starting the, uh, the search with uh, the prepare search method. We can give it an index and a type, <clears throat> and then execute it. This is all asynchronous, as asynchronously uh, executed. So the action get here is the blocking call. Um, afterwards, this search response object is the same we have seen before, like the response to a search. It contains uh, this hit sections where we can, for example, get the total number of hits. And uh, this hit sections then has, um, has the, the list of hits themselves. And we can access the or original source of the object again. When indexing data, <clears throat> we can go the same way. Um, there are different options available. This time, we are starting with one of the builders that are available. Like, this is a static import method, the JSON builder. And this is very useful to just construct the object you want to index. So in this case, uh, you can just say, OK, start object, end object for the JSON structure, and then add field, add array, stuff like this. And 
start objects again. So you, you recreate the JSON structure again using Java code. This can then be used um, with this prepare index method as the source. So this is the document that is then gone, going to be indexed again. You can use a lot of uh, different objects and types for uh, passing as the source document. Like very common is uh, the builder we've seen right now. Just pass it as a string. Like you can use something like Jackson or JSON to, to build a, a string, uh, a JSON representation. And there are some convenience methods here for uh, building very simple objects or just passing it as a map. So there are different options available. Okay, we have seen it connects to an existing cluster. And if you, um, you might have noticed that it didn't use the same port that is used for HTTP. That's because it's using the transport uh, protocol. That's um, why it's named that way. And this is a binary protocol that is also used for the communication inside the cluster. So, of course, this is um, more efficient. So, it looks like this. Basically, all of those communication aspects here, it's all binary. What I didn't talk about before is um, I talked about high, uh, reliability, high availability, uh, but there's only one arrow here going from our application to this node. So if this node goes down, um, we might be screwed, even though uh, there are two more nodes available because our application doesn't talk to it. That's why the transport client and all of the other two clients I'll be introducing later on has feature called uh, sniffing. And this sniffing allows our application to retrieve the state of the cluster from one of the nodes and then talk to all of them in a round robin fashion. So it uh, does client side load balancing. So, and then when this node goes down, we don't have any problem in our application because it can still talk to the other nodes. <clears throat> yeah, you can do this by just passing uh, this as a setting, a setting client transport.sniff, and it will automatically do everything for you, do client side load balancing. Yeah, that's uh, the transport client. Um, the important thing, it has full API support. Like uh, we saw building the queries, um, it has the full support of the current version of Elasticsearch always because it uses the same code uh, that Elasticsearch is using internally. So you will always be up to date. You don't have to, to upgrade your client uh, library for new versions. Um, the communication is very efficient um, because it's the binary protocol and it has the client side load balancing. But there are also some serious drawbacks with the transport client. Um, especially that um, as you're using an internal protocol, you need to be very, very careful with the Elasticsearch versions used in the application and in the cluster. Those need to be nearly the same. I think there are some exceptions, but um, and this makes upgrading a lot more difficult than it should be. Like uh, you have to take care that your application is upgraded with, when the cluster is upgraded, and the other way around. And this is not suitable for for all applications. And they also the JVM version. The JVM version needs to be the same as well, right? And this might be even more uh, dramatic, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> and. Um, Another drawback that can be as worse uh, is that it has the dependency on the full Elasticsearch server. Like uh, when you're pulling down Java, even though it's a, a separate artifact right now, this will pull down all the Java code for, for the Elasticsearch server. And this also means that you will have dependencies on Lucene, on Juice, on different uh, libraries. And especially for existing applications, or if you're integrating either in a CMS or an online shop, an existing one, you will have uh, some dependencies already, and th it can be a real nightmare uh, to, to, to make sure that all of them work together. And it can be even impossible. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's why um, Elastic introduced the REST client with version 5.0.
But so far, are there any questions uh, about the transport client or the stuff I introduced? Fine. If, if there are any questions, just feel free to ask any time. OK, of course, this is different now. Um, our application accesses the Elasticsearch cluster using HTTP instead of the binary protocol. That's the huge difference. Elasticsearch itself will still talk with the transport client, uh, transport protocol, but our application talks to Elasticsearch using HTTP. Of course, this makes it uh, far more um, um, far more independent of the Elasticsearch cluster, of the versions, anything, and even of the API. Like the HTTP API doesn't change uh, that much as the internal stuff. And this is available in Maven Central as well. Like it's just uh, instead of transport, you can use REST. Um, and it has far less dependencies. So there's only, uh, this is actually, I think, one dependency with uh, some transitive dependencies. Like it just uses the Apache HTTP client uh, library. <clears throat> so this is a lot easier to integrate in existing applications, of course. So how do you um, start with it? Um, we saw it on the slide uh, already uh, by Matthias. Um, you can add one or more HTTP hosts that are used for communication. And this is, again, one of the builders, like Elasticsearch is using the builder pattern a lot. And this will create a REST client. The important thing is um, we don't have that many dependencies. And because of that, there is not much support right now for any uh, query DSL structures building them. So the REST client, as it is right now, is um, mostly for talking HTTP. And there is not much support for, for querying and and uh, indexing. So for example, this is one example uh, one might uh, do right now for, for querying Elasticsearch using the REST client. Like um, you create one of those HTTP entities. I think this is also part of the HTTP client, uh, H um, Apache HTTP client. And you really pass the string you want to add as a payload. So in this case, this, it's a match all query because I wouldn't be able to fit a normal query on this slide. But even this might not be as bad as it, as it might seem, because when building an application, you don't have that many different queries. So you can even use something like a, a template engine or something like this, just to store your queries in a text file and load them in the application. Could be fine as well. And then you are passing this um, to the, to the uh, you just perform the request Say you want to go against this endpoint, and that's basically all. And after that, you can just then uh, retrieve the, the uh, result of this request. And again, you will retrieve this HTTP entity. And there's a convenience method for just converting it to a string. But after that, right now, you, you are completely on your own doing something with this string. So you need to maybe use something like JSON path or uh, some features like this. Um, to get the information you'd like to have. There will be a lot more coming with this. Um, there will be a, a separate query DSL. It's talked about, but I'm not sure how long it will take, and I think I Matthias as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But it will be. This will be the future of Elasticsearch. <clears throat> so, I didn't show the indexing part because it's basically the same, just uh, pass a JSON string in the body. The important thing is um, the REST client is less dependent on the Elasticsearch version and uh, of the JDK version. Um, something which can all, all also be very important, especially for larger operations, um, there's a clean separation between uh, the cluster and the rest of the application network. Like, you don't have to open any ports beside the HTTP port to your cluster, and it's all internal, the communication. Um, this can also be very uh, beneficial when it comes to, to firewalls. I have seen very bad things happening with uh, some corporate firewalls and, and the transport protocol. Yeah, it has minimal dependency, which is very good. There's an additional library. <coughs> um, the the, that supports sniffing. This has some more dependencies. It has a dependency on Jackson and a bit more. 
But uh, then it can also do the client-side load balancing we have seen with the transport client. There's a lot more like error handling, timeouts, basic auth, and so on. But uh, for now, no query support, no indexing support. That's the state of Elasticsearch 5.0. <clears throat> Um, Elastic didn't have any um, HTTP client until this version, <clears throat> but you were able to use it even before. By the way, the REST client can also be used with uh, Elasticsearch 2.x versions, so it's not tied to Elasticsearch 5. The Chest client is an older client. Uh, it's a community uh, project, so Elastic is not uh, involved in the building the project. And this is an, <clears throat> an alternative REST client for Elasticsearch. And it's still maintained. Again, available in Maven Central. Um, doesn't follow the, naming, uh, the versioning scheme of Elastic, but yeah. <clears throat> and it has a client object as well. And um, it can be created using a factory. It's really similar with all the libraries, like you pass in the, the URL you want to access. You can use multiple threads, and then you have the client that is then also um, uh, responsible for querying and indexing and stuff. Again, it doesn't have much support for querying, so um, you will have your JSON string somewhere, and um, it will. you can either have it in a text file, or you can build it using string concatenation, or you can even use the Elasticsearch cl uh, classes for building them, but of course then you have the dependency on Elasticsearch again. It's really similar API, but not the same. It also has some builder classes where you can just um, build the request and then execute the search. The search result, <clears throat> one way to access the data is uh, it supports this JSON object, I like this, uh, object structure so you can really navigate all the way down. But this is not what you do normally with a chest. This is uh, far, too, far too complicated, uh, accessing this JSON structure. So the good thing about chest is that it supports uh, Java beans. So what you can do is you build a Java bean, classical stuff like having properties and getters and setters for it. Maybe assign a chest ID like the field that will have, in this case, the auto-generated ID. And that's all you have to do. Then you can just um, make sure the chest um, populates this class uh, from the JSON it retrieves from Elasticsearch, which is really nice, of course. And again, you can just use your Java beans for anything you might want to do. Of course, the same is true for indexing. You can just uh, pass Java beans to to Jest, and those will be indexed, which is really nice. Yeah, it's an alternative HTTP implementation. Has been around for a long time, so I think not not that few people are using it, especially in the case when uh, when you you have the requirement that the dependencies are too much. Yeah, the queries still are strings. But you can index and search Java beans, which is really nice. And it also supports sniffing. They call it node discovery, but it's basically the same as in transport and REST client. So that's all I wanted to show you about the clients. There's one more thing I want to show you, which is Spring Data Elasticsearch. This is not really a client. Um, this is more an abstraction on a higher level. Um, it uses the Elasticsearch clients and provides a bit more around it, which can be uh, a nice thing for people, especially for people starting with Elasticsearch, I would say. So what is Spring Data? Is any, who's using Spring Data already? Some of the projects, a lot of the people. That's good, that's good, because it's a really nice family of projects. What they are doing is uh, they provide um, abstractions for different data stores, like for relational databases, uh, for MongoDB, for um, for Redis, I think, and a lot more. And they don't try to, to uh, pull everything in, in one module, but uh, they make the speciality of the data store still available. So a key value store has different uh, characteristics than a document database, for example, and this is reflected in the projects. Something which can be very impressive is the dynamic repository implementations we will see later. 
And yeah, the, I think the most popular modules are Spring Data JPA and Spring Data MongoDB, which is um, very, very nice, both of them. And of course, there's a, a module for Elasticsearch as well. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, built by the community as well. So this is not really done by the people behind the Spring framework, but uh, by some people outside, but it's still released with the Spring framework. <clears throat> so how it works is that you, you annotate your, your Java classes with some attributes, like in this case, this is a special annotations for the Spring Data Elasticsearch. Um, and you can tell it different stuff, like for example, the index name it should use, and some more characteristics. Then you can either, um, this is the, the simplest way to do it, like you can just add the uh, ID annotation to one field, but you can also influence the other fields how they will be stored. So there's support for the analyzing process available as well. <clears throat> what you can then do is um, use this class you created uh, to type an interface with it. So this is the we just create an empty interface um, called dish repository in this case because we want to search the food. And um, this extends the Elasticsearch CRUD repository, which is a special uh, interface. Um, there are more available in the project, but this is one you can use. So once you have done this, you can now just configure it. Of course, you can use um, Java config as well. Like um, it has an own namespace um, where you can, for example, just create um, an Elasticsearch client. So this will be a, a standard transport client which is created here. It uses the Elasticsearch template um, for doing the basic operations. But the really important thing is this below here. This will scan our class path for any interfaces that um, inherit of one, from one of the uh, Spring Data interfaces. So this will automatically create implementations for these interfaces. So we don't have to write any code for, uh, for accessing Elasticsearch. All of this will be done automatically. So in this case, um, we can again just create the Java bean and call this repository safe method, which is available automatically, and uh, pass it one or more Java objects. And this will persist the data, index it, <clears throat> and afterwards, we can, of course, search it again. These are the basic methods um, that are available on this CRUD interface. Like you can just retrieve all of them or find one by ID. This is not very exciting for a search uh, engine. Like we want to have our query on our fields or on, on the text data. So what we can do uh, with Spring Data Elasticsearch is just add more me methods to this interface. So for example, we, we can um, add a method find by food. And just by using this naming convention, find by food, um, it will build an implementation that queries the field food for the parameter that is given here. So this makes a, a, a very uh, nice um, uh, language for querying your data, like you can have some stuff like find by favorite price less than, which will then do a, a, a range query for the price and return all the dishes for you. So th this is really nice if you don't want to get that deep into Elasticsearch and just want to do some basic queries. So there's also support for, for adding the query as a JSON string, and you can even implement uh, the methods yourself and do any custom logic you will, you want to do. So that's the great thing about Spring Data. It's a high level abstraction. Um, so it uses the existing client, it uses the transport client or something older, which is not uh, um, uh, recommended anymore. And there is a pull request for, for using Jest for um, accessing the data. So it might even be possible in the future to use the HTTP communication. And I think somebody might be working on the, on the, HTTP, uh, on the REST client for Elasticsearch. You're using entity beans. The dynamic repositories are really, really nice. Yeah, the HTTP support is in the making. But <clears throat> um, to be honest, the project itself is not the fastest, fastest pace, unfortunately. 
So it's still currently it's stuck on version 2.2 of Elasticsearch, and um, a lot of features are missing. So if somebody is interested in, in uh, uh, providing a bit of development work for one of the Spring Data projects, this would be a very, very good case. Yeah, but for my impression, it's, it's more for people um, who don't want to dig that deep in Elasticsearch, so normally you will use one of the clients instead. This is if you're using Spring Data already and want to use it again. So that's all I have to talk about. Like we saw the transport client, which has the benefit of full API support, but uh, you have to live with the Elasticsearch dependency. The REST client that uses HTTP, but is lacking in features right now. This will change, and I'm, I'm sure this will be a very nice thing in the future. And there's Chest, which you can also use right now. Like, it's a bit difficult what to recommend right now because, of course, once there is good support for the HTTP client in Elastic, maybe the chest support will not be that good anymore. And the, uh, the, the API is a bit different, so you might have to switch at one case. And there's Spring Data Elasticsearch, which is really more suited for, for people either starting with Elasticsearch or um, using Spring Data already and want to use it everywhere. Yeah, that's all I have. And there, of course, you can find uh, for the transport client and the REST client, you can find a lot of information on the Elastic website, on the reference manual. Um, um, Jest is on GitHub. It used to be by a company called Searchbox. I'm a bit concerned that this company doesn't exist anymore, but there's still development on the project. Um, Spring Data, another one. And uh, all the example code is also on GitHub on my account. And I will also publish uh, like a transcript of this talk, like I wrote all of it down uh, on my blog, so you can read uh, all of it there again. So thank you again. <laughs> I'm happy that my voice and the laptop both uh, finished. Are there any questions? Yeah. About the concept of sniffing, yeah. so it allows your client to talk to multiple nodes in a cluster and not uh, crash along with a, a crashed uh, node. Yeah. But yeah. what if what if a node is instantly crashed? Uh, is there intelligence in the client to kind of shut it off from the pool of, yeah. of clusters? Like uh, what what they will be, it it, uh, it differs a bit in the implementation of the different clients, um, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, for the transport client, for example, it will check every five seconds. It will do a, a special request on the Elasticsearch API. Elasticsearch has a monitoring API where you can re retrieve the state of the current cluster. And it will use this for building the information uh, um, which clients to access. So as a crash node will not be in this cluster state, um, uh, it will not be queried again. Like it might be queried once, I think, or even a bit more, um, but uh, after a while, it should be uh, should be fine again. Like I think it's five seconds uh, it checks, or in, in other clients it's a few minutes. But uh, you can configure it in all of them. What happens in then? In the new REST client, there is there is some way, some scoring when a connection fails. Yeah. So it's going to apply like a like a back off algorithm. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Like there is good functionality for this case. Yeah. 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 Is there a, a concept of guided search, just like an Oracle Endica? You actually add <coughs> more filters and it narrows down the research. How, how do we uh, like um, achieve this kind of a like what what you um, this? If I if I get it correctly. This is also something like the faceting feature, like uh, something you, you can see on Amazon, like yeah. clicking on the categories. Yeah, you, you will use the aggregation feature. It can build these facets, and then you can add filter queries um, for refining uh, the search result. So this is a very common feature to use, yeah. Yeah. And especially with, with larger data, data sets, this can be very beneficial for the user. Um, because um, it, it helps them uh, uh, to find the right thing because they, they might be, um, they, 
at first they might not know what they are looking for, but later on they can see which facets are available and then just click on one and it's better, yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, you can also reach me uh, with, uh, you can ask any questions uh, using email or Twitter or anything, or I'm around here for a few minutes, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>